All right, let's lighten things up. We will move on now to uh, movie reviews, little TV reviews, maybe some sports, all things culture. It is Michael Snyder, everybody, and he comes and goes on a rainbow. Welcome in, Michael Snyder. I am happy to be a little beam of light, a little ray of sunshine uh, in an otherwise gloomy circumstance, Kim. Great to have Mark back. You've been doing yeoman work, uh, Albert. uh, Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to all. That's right. It ain't over yet. Today is the fifth day of the 12 days of Christmas with seven more to come until 12th night. And uh, yeah, my big question here is, where are my five golden rings? I want my <laughs> five golden rings. Where are they? I have to thank you, Michael Snyder, for really being that ray of sunshine in all of 2023 and coming in, wrapping up the week for us on Fridays with um, some spirit and some jokes and some fun. You are so appreciated. Oh, thanks, Kim. And, um, yeah. you know, New Year's Day is going to be here this coming Monday. And may it just be the first of 365 new days in an entire year that yeah. moves forward in real time and ends on December 31st, 2024, or we are really screwed, okay? I mean, <laughs> it better be business as usual, you know? When yeah, you are the partier, you are all over the place in Los Angeles and San Francisco and going to these hip, cool, artsy kind of places. What are you doing on New Year's Eve? Well, I will probably watch um, the ball drop, um, okay. and I'm talking about my uh, uh, adolescent oh. cousin. What? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not him. Anyway, yeah. uh, I will probably watch a little uh, New York Times uh, Square fun, you know, and okay. what have you. And then I'm I'm in Los Angeles this weekend, and I'm going to go to the uh, Constellation Club at the Formosa, the legendary Formosa restaurant and bar where um, Sinatra and the Rat Pack and many other famous people used to socialize back in the day for Chinese food and and cocktails. And the Constellation Club is a very groovy event with uh, deep cut soul and R&B and rock music uh, of the disco tech era, you know, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, I think it's going to be real glamorous and, and a lot of fun. So that's Whoa. that's my plan for New Year's Eve. And then New Year's Day, I'm just going to kick back like everybody else. Maybe do one of those um, southern breakfast, lunch, and dinner situations where you yeah. you know you have uh, black eyed peas for good luck. I don't even remember what the menu is supposed to represent, but there is a special luck menu people in the South present to one another yeah. on New Year's Day, and and maybe I'll go for that. Do you have any resolutions? Um, no, I don't, because uh, I don't want to put any pressure on myself. The world does <laughs> enough of that, right? That's true. That's true. We have enough pressure as it is. All right. Tell me what's going on at the big, big movies. Well, you know, we've uh, covered most of the important films over the course of the past few months, the ones that are uh, awards bait um, and what have you. And there are a few that have fallen through the cracks or um, uh, come to streaming that I just wanted to quickly uh, let you know about, and they're all pretty mediocre. And then I think, you know, we should probably talk about my favorite films of the year since this is our last broadcast of 2023. Um, so I'll just kick off this like mini review segment with Rebel Moon Part One, A, Children, a Child of Fire, which is a new film from uh, movie maker Zack Snyder. No relation. I have no relation to this guy. He has made some films I really like, like Watchmen and 300. And he's made some that I've been like on the fence about, like Man of Steel, as he moved into being the uh, major creative force behind DC Comics movies over the past decade or so. And he also made uh, the initial cut and then had to put on his uh you know editor's cap and do a revised director's cut of justice league which was taken from him because of personal circumstances he was facing uh by um, movie maker and the tv creator joss whedon um and he's very very much um a dividing force in fandom some people love his work others don't um and rebel moon part one shows why you know i shrug at uh, a lot of his movies uh it is a sci-fi thing that folds in a lot of familiar tropes and um reflects years and years of, of 
bigger, more important films. For instance, this movie calls to mind Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, which influenced a very famous science fiction franchise, and that's George Lucas's Star Wars. And there are elements of the first Star Wars film, uh, Chapter 4, New Hope, in Rebel Moon. And uh, essentially, uh, um, a young woman who is trying to get away from things on a farming uh, community on some small asteroid or, or mini planet finds herself uh, brought into uh, a revolutionary situation when the villainous fascist regime comes down and tries to basically uh, abuse these farmers and take all of their crops, uh, basically leaving them destitute. And so this uh, radicalizes this young woman and she teams up with a bunch of different uh, various and sundry uh, comrades, and they try to bring down uh, this fascist uh, interstellar government. Uh, and, uh, hey, you know, uh, you do get some actors I like, uh, such as Sophia Boutella uh, as the main character, the reluctant freedom fighter, Cora, Jimon Honsu as a rebel general, and you I get like Ed him. Screen. Yeah, he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Ed Screen as a, a, a villainous um, officer uh, working for this, uh, you know, fascist uh, you know, uh, galaxy wide. I don't know how big their reach is, but it, it's a government and they're not very pleasant. Uh, and, you know, Michael Huseman, uh, Duna Bai, um, Ray Fisher, Charlie Hunnam, and Jenna Malone. And you even get Anthony Hopkins voicing a friendly robot. So there is talent here, but it's so derivative. And it kind of plods along, too. And it, this is only part one. This guy's pretty long-winded. Mm. His Justice League cut, I think, uh, ended up being pushing four hours, if I'm not mistaken. So you've got uh, what is meant to be an epic science fiction uh, and fantasy, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, like a big franchise mm -hmm. tentpole of sorts and you know i mean i kept going uh, get to the point get to the point which is what i should say yeah. about this review uh this is a mediocre film rebel moon part one a child of fire uh the guy's got talent there's visual flair for days here but that's uh, insufficient to make this uh fun and exciting so mm -hmm. far there will be a part two this coming uh year and uh again this is uh available via netflix so you could just watch it at home and make up your own mind if you want tom is dinging you for derivative so we'll take it well i uh, i <laughs> yeah sure whatever you say tom uh, moving <laughs> on uh you know i get a big kick out of please don't destroy the three-man comedy troupe of writers on saturday night live who yeah. uh, for the past season uh, and a little more uh, have been doing these sort of pre-recorded um skits that last between three and five minutes on the show and uh you know uh, they're kind of sly self-deprecating uh you know vignettes that show that these uh, three nerdy goofy uh, clumsy millennials uh don't know what they're doing and uh, are butting heads but are pretty funny in the process and they usually incorporate whoever the guest host is you know, I enjoy uh, these guys. And in fact, they're three legacy comedy writer performers. Their dads uh, are all uh, SNL veterans, I, I believe. I know uh, one of them in particular, uh, uh, I guess uh, his name is uh, John Higgins. I think his father is like one of the producers and the sidekick on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, Martin Hurley is uh, one of the three, and Ben Marshall. And they're just, you know, they're, they're entertaining in small bursts. But this is a feature-length film called Please Don't Destroy, uh, the, the name of the troupe, The Treasure of Foggy Mountain. And there are a few uh, laughs to be had here. But what rocks in, over the course of five minutes on an episode of SNL, uh, is pretty exhausting over the course of 90 minutes, even with Conan O'Brien playing the abusive father of one of the guys, the red-haired one, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, Bowen Yang of SNL as a conniving cult leader whose followers uh, live on the titular mountain, Foggy Mountain, and of course, as the three guys pursue the treasure that they think will make them all millionaires um, multiple times over, they encounter uh, this cult. I, you know, I, I gave it every break and it wasn't terrible. 
but it also wasn't the sort of thing where I went, oh, we'd love another movie from Please Don't Destroy. Please don't destroy your short vignettes on SNL, guys. <laughs> but you may want to rethink doing a feature film. Uh, oh. I, I wasn't you know again yeah. uh this one is on peacock so it's streaming and available and may i want i want to also point out the narrator of the movie is john goodman so uh, again you know there there is talent here but it, right. it just it wasn't funny enough let's put it that way mm -hmm. that's too and, bad uh, i know and i know this is a little late um but i, I did want to talk briefly about candy cane lane which <laughs> is uh eddie murphy's uh holiday comedy which came out uh very recently i uh, tried to watch those... that <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, it's, uh, it's on amazon essentially it's about uh, a guy who lives on uh what people come to call candy cane lane it's a couple of blocks in Los Angeles or the Los Angeles area where people go all out for the holidays to make the most lavish and dazzling of Christmas displays. And it's very competitive on the part of everyone. And in fact, a friend of mine lives in a house on an actual LA area candy cane lane, which is so jammed up with cars during the holidays. This is no joke that it can take an hour to drive one block. And that fact in itself is more exciting than this movie. And uh, I have to also point out that there's talent here. Tracy Ellis Ross, so good yeah. in American fiction, plays uh, the Eddie Murphy character's wife. Um, you know, you've got a few other talented people. You have like Jillian Bell playing a kind of uh, rogue elf who brings trouble down on uh, Eddie Murphy's character and uh, his family when he tries to go all out to win the big prize being offered to the most lavish decorations uh, on Candy Cane Lane uh, in the year that this movie is supposed to take place. Uh, yeah. It just wasn't funny enough. I, you know, I, I it again, wasn't the me acting, it was the story. Yeah, they were just mediocre. Uh, right? it just yeah. Yeah, toothless, if you will. Uh, and, you know, Ron Howard produced it. Uh, uh, Reginald Hudlin, a, a really good director, was the uh, was the guy in charge of uh, helming this movie. Uh, I, I just the, the script by Kelly Younger. I don't want to like single Kelly Younger out, but you know the script was was pretty feeble, and uh, the jokes were not all that funny. And yet, you know, Eddie Murphy, charismatic to the max. Yeah, he you is. Know? I mean, so, and part uh, of it's nice to see him again. You know, and uh, back on the the screen and the lead, but I just I was disappointed in that. Movie. Yeah, I, you know, um, I want to uh, make one more quick note about movies I haven't discussed yet that came yeah. out this year that I think are worthwhile. And uh, uh, the movie I wanted to talk very briefly about is called Past Lives. And it didn't make my top 10 for the year, but it is one of the best films I've seen this year. And it is, uh, you know, it, it's ambitious in terms of the emotional content. Uh, it's a small film. It's about a young woman um, from Korea, South Korea, uh, who basically grows up uh, in New York and is separated from a childhood friend, and they reunite in New York many, many years later and think about their relationship, talk about the relationship and and their sort of puppy love. And they, they it, it's a beautiful, very well acted film, uh, which is written and directed by Celine Song and stars a somewhat familiar face as the young woman in in uh, the central role here, Greta Lee. If you saw Russian Doll, she was. Uh, the main character's best friend, uh, and she was uh, very engaging there. And it, generally speaking, um, I, I try to like get these like smaller movies or or less publicized films uh, in front of the Mark Thompson show audience. And mm -hmm. this is something I just missed. It fell through the cracks, which happens on occasion. Yeah, Past no. Lives is a beautiful, beautiful movie, and I highly recommend it. Um, uh, if you have an opportunity to see it, I believe it's available uh, VOD right now. And um, it's uh, it, it just very moving, uh, witty and uh, and touching. I is really, it, really loved it. Is it subtitles or is it in English? Uh, when they speak uh, Korean, yes, it's subtitled, but mm -hmm. um, much of it is in English. You know, and okay. again, 
it, it's absolutely worth it. Uh, yeah. Speaking of great movies, should we talk a little bit about my favorite films of 2023? Do we Me? have the time? I have my pencil and I'm ready to write down the, the Michael Snyder list. Go ahead. All right, all right, all right. Uh, we're going to go alphabetical because that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, these are movies. I, I couldn't possibly see every release over the past 12 months, but the mm-hmm. ones I caught, these were the ones that were the standouts. Um, uh, American Fiction, uh, very impressive debut feature from director and screenwriter Cord Jefferson. Uh, American Fiction, it's crackling satire in the context of an interpersonal dramedy, spiky and funny and, and savvy. A look at the inescapable impact of racial stereotyping, uh, social status and public perception in the digital world. And Jeffrey Wright is absolutely superb as Monk, an intellectually evolved uh, but self-important black mm-hmm. scholar and author from a well-to-do but dysfunctional family that still plagues him. Uh, and his career takes this bizarre turn when he cranks out a fake ghetto memoir as a joke, and it becomes a sensation. Loved American fiction. Um Dream Scenario is the uh, darkly comic and thoughtful uh, showcase for Nicolas Cage's talents. It's his latest um, impactful movie, and it it offers one of his absolutely finest performances. He's a a hapless college professor whose career and marriage are in a rut, uh, and uh, suddenly millions of people are seeing him in their dreams, turning him into a celebrity. And as this phenomenon of, uh, of, I don't know, benign nocturnal appearances goes viral, he tries to profit off it, but things change as quickly as they started. Uh, Christopher Borg, who wrote the um, bracing script and directed it with flair, has given Cage what I believe is truly a dream role in a movie uh, very smart, um, with less than flattering things to say about modern culture and society. The Holdovers um, is number three on the list. And again, these are in alphabetical order. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't say that one is better than the other. Uh, they're all pretty terrific. Uh, the Holdovers is about three people thrown together during Christmas break at a New England prep school in 1970. Uh, they are a very mean-spirited teacher played by uh, Paul Giamatti, an emotionally damaged student, uh, played by newcomer Dominic Sessa. Uh, He can't go home for the holidays. And the facility's um, head cook, uh, played by Divine Joy Randolph, um, and she deserves every accolade coming her way during award season, as does uh, Giamatti and Sessa. Um, This is about them bonding and, and surviving this chilly, uh, late December in 1970, um, a timeless slice of humanity, very wise and moving film from the great director and uh, screenwriter Alexander Payne, who did Sideways and About Schmidt. All right, here's one that's a little off the beaten track. Okay. I don't think a lot of people have mentioned it, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which is about a an unlikely team of environmental activists who want to take on the fossil fuel industry and more. Uh, and this is one of the smartest and best es- uh, executed thrillers I've seen in a long time, uh, a relative uh, unknowns in the cast. And it's a detailed portrait of this committed group of rebels, how they came together, and a really tense depiction of their plan and how it may or may not achieve their ends um, uh, with kind of treacherous possibilities uh, in, in front of them. Um, it's adapting a book by Andreas Baum, and it's very cinema verite, and director-screenwriter uh, Daniel uh, Goldhaber has delivered a movie that's topical and relevant and uh, volatile action and mystery and character study. I, I loved it. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon Uh, finds uh, the master of the cinematic arts, Martin Scorsese, in great form. This is a triumph, um, and uh, it is an expansive and stirring investigation into the notorious reign of terror that plagued the Osage Nation uh, in uh, Oklahoma, the uh, Native American tribe, during the 20s. Um, uh, This is a long movie, almost three and a half hours, but it never lags. Historical epic about the persecution of the Native American population. It's a murder mystery and police procedural. It's a love story, um, multiple family saga, and um, a tale of culture clash. Uh, And Scorsese expertly orchestrates this, and it's enriched by 
fantastic performances from Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, Jesse Plemons, and Lily Gladstone, the latter of whom almost steals the film, the least known of the four actors, Killers of the Flower Moon. Monster is uh, Hirokazu Koreeda's latest film. This guy's the world-class Japanese director who has made these movies that invariably cause me to tear up. That's right, me the hard ass. Koreeda makes films that, that move me to tears. Shoplifters, Broker, uh, The Incredibly Heartbreaking Nobody Knows, uh, all of which have to do uh, with the uh, well-being of children at risk for the most part, even though they're very different films. And he has continued this impressive string with Monster, which uh, also concerns child welfare, although here in the context of school bullying and parental neglect and the implicit uh, failings of educational systems beautiful, beautiful film, and all the bizarre uh, and different different points of view that look at this thing, uh, either distort or, or show only a small part of the bigger picture, which reminds me a little bit of, uh, I will bring him up again, Akira Kurosawa, but in this case, his movie Rashomon. Uh, Oppenheimer, truly a blockbuster at three hours long. It's filmmaker uh, Christopher Nolan's epic and meticulously rendered movie biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the A-bomb, and -hmm. it has all the uh, majesty and fearful power of a nuclear explosion. That's right, Mm -hmm. I said it. Anyway, uh, Killian Murphy uh, from Peaky Blinders is haunting as Oppenheimer, the brilliant uh, left-leaning physicist whose approach to building a bomb would uh, defeat the Axis in World War II, and also launched the Atomic Age. Great performances by Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon and Kenneth Branagh among the Mm -hmm. uh, cast members, and Florence Pugh as Oppenheimer's lover and Emily Blunt as his wife. It is thrilling, absorbing, and meaningful. Uh, Poor Things is next on the list. Uh, Stunning in every sense of the word. It's the latest ambitious and invariably idiosyncratic presentation from the maverick Greek director Yorgos Lanthimos. And this is a reimagining of the tale of Frankenstein uh, as unhinged social commentary. And it mixes body horror, sexual politics, feminist manifesto, and a kind of Candide-like coming of age story set in Britain in the late 1800s at first. Uh, Willem Dafoe plays a deformed, controlling genius, and in his lab, he resurrects a young woman named Bella, but when she's brought to life and she finds uh, what life is about and starts to discover her autonomy, uh, things do not go the way the uh, scientist planned. Mark Ruffalo is great in a supporting role as a conniving lawyer and a terrific performance by Emma Stone as Bella, um, the newborn, fully grown woman. Um, let's move on to The Taste of Things, which is set uh, in the Sylvan French countryside circa 1885. And it's a beautiful passion infused and appetite sharpening mix of Belle Epoque period drama, love story, and foodie movie Mm -hmm. from the award-winning French Vietnamese filmmaker Tran An Hung, who is uh, the maker of The Scent of Green Papaya, another lovely film with a a food connection. And this features Juliette Binoche uh, as incandescent. Oh, she's wonderful. Uh, she's She glows here as Eugenie, whose kitchen skills have enhanced the reputation of her boss, Dodin, as one of the great chefs of the era. Uh, Dodin, played by Benoit Majumel, wants to woo Eugenie and get her to commit to their two decades romance by preparing exquisite meals for her. And we are party to the preparation and consumption of these glorious repasts. And I'll just wrap up my top 10 huh? with... The Zone of Interest, which is a chilling and chilly movie from British director and co-screenwriter Jonathan Glazer. It's an adaptation of uh, the novel by Martin Amos about the mundane but privileged family life of an SS officer who serves as the commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp Mm -hmm. during World War II. His wife and children live with him in a nice house next to the camp, and they go about their daily endeavors, entertaining guests, unfazed by the evil happening beyond their garden wall. This is a powerful movie and a very uh, fascinating and original take on the Holocaust. Uh, I I thought the zone of interest draining and absolutely brilliant. 
So there, that's my top 10. Awesome. Uh, maybe I'll talk about some of my other favorites with Mark next week, uh, things that didn't make the uh, the cut. But I definitely uh, want to talk briefly about some TV programs that have um, come to my yeah. attention. What do we you don't say? Have a, yeah, we don't have a lot of time left. So what are we looking at on TV? What, what are the, if I'm looking for a, something new to watch, what's the Michael Snyder recommendation? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I will... I will have to say that I don't know that it, that it would necessarily be uh, your cup of tea okay? Um, because, you know, we all have different uh, tastes and what have you. Yeah. But I actually um, have had a great time watching Such Brave Girls on Hulu. Uh, it's created and written by Kat Sadler, uh, a young woman uh, in the UK, a comedian and, and a comedy writer. And she and her sister in real life, Lizzie Davidson, uh, play 20-something sisters, Josie, depressed and suicidal and closeted. And Billy, who is desperate for attention, uh, sex obsessed and a little dim, and with their nightmare of a single mother, are the most selfish and needy family imaginable. And they are brutally funny. Such Brave Girls is uh, six half hour episodes. And uh, I loved it. And it, it's wow. It, it's just just absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I also quickly want to mention two uh, animated things. Blue Eye Samurai on Netflix is one of the most beautiful animated things I've ever seen, film or television. And it's uh, a period uh, drama set in Japan. Uh, and our titular samurai uh, mm -hmm. is a half breed. Um, you know, a Westerner has um, basically uh, mated with a Japanese woman. And the child is an outcast because uh, at that juncture in history, Japan wanted to uh, eliminate any and all uh, white interlopers from the country. And it is it's just exciting and funny. And again, one of the most beautifully animated things I have ever seen um, in my entire uh, movie and TV going experience. There's never been anything like this. <laughs> OK, uh, and the next one. Um, well, I will stick it uh, to animation. What if season two from Marvel via Disney Plus? Uh, um, and again, uh, you know, maybe you're not a Marvel fan. Um, maybe you are. And this is a series of half hour animated stories that suggest what would happen if things didn't play out as we know them to play out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I just want to tell you, the voice actors reprising their live action roles from Marvel movies include Kate Blanchett, Jeffrey Wright, Sam Jackson, Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Haley Atwell, Benedict Cumberbatch, Paul Rudd, Mark Ruffalo, Michael Douglas, Sam Rockwell, and more. So, uh, they all committed to this thing, and it, it's fascinating. If you are a Marvel fan, this is a wonderful, wonderful set of stories. And again, it's the second season, yeah. both of which are available on Disney+. Plus. Okay, well, I have written down your list. And if anybody wants the list, please email me, kim at theafterparty.live, and I will send it out to you. Michael Snyder, thank you for being here. Happy New Year, my friend. Same to you, and uh, I'm going to God. Uh, I want to thank everybody involved in the Mark Thompson show. Happy New Year to all. May you never yeah. get too old to forget the Lang Syne or to make some good new times with your acquaintances, That's be right. they old or otherwise. Thank you, Michael Snyder. Happy New Year to you. He comes and goes. On a rainbow. Snyder. Hey, go Niners. Go Niners indeed.